22. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come into pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And a poem, Boy at the Window, by Richard Wilbur. Seeing the snowman standing all alone in dusk and cold is more than he can bear. The small boy weeps to hear the wind prepare a night of gnashings, an enormous moan. His tearful sight can hardly reach to where the pale-faced figure with bitumen eyes returns him such a God-forsaken stare as outcast Adam gave to paradise. The man of snow is nonetheless content, having no wish to go inside and die. Still, he is moved to see the youngster cry. Though frozen water is his element, he melts enough to drop from one soft eye a trickle of the purest rain, a tear for the child at the bright pane, surrounded by such warmth, such light, such love, and so much fear. Finally, uh, words of Jesus from Matthew 18. <coughs> Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. <coughs> Sometimes you don't know how isolated you are until suddenly someone else is there for you. And this hit me with the force of revelation when I was in my early 40s. I was in transition into a new job out of ordinary parish ministry into a, a high-profile regional responsibility. It was very exciting. My ego liked it a lot. <laughs> Part of me realized that I was walking into a new arena where things would probably be a lot more intense and where I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing, probably for the first couple of years. The other part of me was saying, bring it on, because I was itching for a new challenge. I never really gave a thought to where my support would come from. That's not a thing I tend to worry about. There are good people everywhere. Or uh, another way of putting it is that my normal choice is to muddle through by myself, preferably with nobody else ever knowing that I needed help. There were various preparations laid on for me. Uh, it was all taking place over the course of several months. And then towards the end, they invited me to the monthly meeting of the team. And it blew me away. Their agenda was long, but before they got down to business, one member uh, led a Bible study, the kind that sets the room on fire. And then they checked in with one another. The woman I was going to be replacing spoke first. Uh, when she was new, she was the only woman around that table of 12. I really screwed up last week, she said, and went on. She was describing a situation where she'd been called in to help, but instead she made such a mess of it that she um, left everything worse than when she'd arrived. Wow, I thought. Uh, we clergy do not admit our failures to each other. When you are ordained, they issue you with this kind of mask of competence and confidence, and you're supposed to wear it 24-7, always cheerful and strong and sure, especially in the company of other ministers. But lo and behold, they didn't freeze her out. They smiled sympathetically, and they did that righteous indignation thing about the issue that had tripped her up, and then they helped her brainstorm what she should do next. Remarkable. <laughs> then it was the turn of the man sitting next to her. He was on the verge of retirement with just a couple of months to go, and he told us 
how the churches under his care had organized a party for him, a retirement party. And they'd uh, done that thing, all the speeches, like you would do for someone at the end of a, a distinguished career. This guy marked with every kind of success the church has to offer. You know, he said, uh, for years, I leave the house at 8 o'clock in the morning, I get home at 10 o'clock at night, every day. Um, and, and that was what I wanted to do. I worked hard. <coughs> but those were the years when my kids were growing up. I missed them. I totally miss them, and now it's too late. Looking back, I'd give anything to be able to do it over again. Well, Ami went around the circle, and then they prayed for each other, and for other situations they made where uh, people or churches were in some kinds of trouble, and then they tackled the business. I was part of that monthly meeting for the next 10 years, and it was like that the whole time. My impression was that maybe it didn't last, and the membership of the meeting was constantly, slowly changing. Each time a new person came in or somebody left, it would be a bit different. And certainly I know that other people in the job have felt lonely and isolated and unsupported. But my experience was belonging to a community of soulmates. Laughter, lots of laughter, and tears, and arguments, and passion, and discoveries. And every month, that incredible opening of the scriptures. And colleagues, I knew I could call in the middle of the night if I needed to, which I did once or twice, as they also once or twice reached out to me. <clears throat> the question I bring this morning is whether there's any chance we could be that kind of community for one another in this church, as the reality of climate change presses in around us. My experience with those regional ministers was like being in the trenches together. We were all facing the same kinds of challenges and problems, and we solved a few of them. But mostly, we were just there for each other as people who knew and understood. <coughs> Climate change puts us all in the trenches together. Jim Antal, the guy whose book we're reading in our book group right now, says that the whole human race now lives at the same address. 407, he says, 407 parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Actually, he wrote the book last year. I think the number is 414 now. We weren't supposed to let it rise over 350, so it's dire. But you live here in the Pacific Northwest, and the sun is shining, and everything's beautiful, the trees are glorious, and they just make your spirit sing. And the numbers are so abstract and unlikely and nothing to do with us, right? The chances are this summer we'll have another spell of hot weather, maybe s uh, smoke from other people's fires, maybe mosquitoes, that's the part I read. But it's gorgeous here, pretty nearly perfect. Only our planet is in trouble. Cyclone Kenneth hit Mozambique on April 25th, that's 10 days ago. The strongest tropical storm they've experienced since modern records began. 140 mile per hour winds at landfall, six and a half feet of rain, 41 people killed and 30,000 evacuated, over 60% of their crops destroyed. And that's after Cyclone Ide hit in mid-March, killing 600. <coughs> leaving the whole central area of their country underwater. And now, of course, there's cholera. The day before yesterday, Cyclone Fani hit the state of Odisha on the Bay of Bengal in eastern India. A million people evacuated. How do you evacuate a million people? Bangladesh mobilized an evacuation of two million people in preparation. And then the storm hit them. Now a thousand villages are submerged. I can't imagine it. I can't get the picture to focus in my head. And that's just the cyclones. In other places, it's drought, unprecedented summer temperatures, polar ice melting, and sea levels rising, and sea acidity too. That's very good. <laughs> Not a bit more perfect. <laughs> the 
reason for 1111 is that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Control has told us we have only 11 years left to stop the emissions or the changes will be irreversible. But here's the thing, we know it, right? We know all this, we don't come to church to hear it. And I want to assure you that I am absolutely not in the business of hammering you for the next six Sundays with these unbearable stories and statistics and lists. It's not my job to give you science lessons or a political rally kind of talk or psychology or weather reports. There are plenty of places to go for all that sort of thing. My thing is church. So here's what I want to say. It's becoming increasingly hard to imagine that the human race is going to make it through. I'm not going to whitewash that. It will take radical commitment of the sort that we have never had to mobilize before. And as well as being a spiritual and economic and a million other kinds of challenge, that's a spiritual challenge. We have everything we need to turn the situation around, including um, stories we could tell of phenomenal achievements of our species before. We only need the will to do it. And at the end of this six weeks, I promise you that the note that I will sound is hope, but not the cheap kind of hope. Not the kind of hope that's rooted in denial, not the kind of hope that just says we're not going to think about it. And we need something stronger than that. This is so massive, so completely outside our experience, that our natural reaction is just to shy away from it. All the statistics and the science and the terrible frightening news. But what if we didn't run away? What if we faced it? And my thing, what if we reinvented church? for this new day. If we worked together, do you think we could create a safe enough and relevant enough space that we could come here knowing what we know and feeling all the different things we feel and offer each other the kind of loving, robust, in the trenches kind of support that I experienced from those regional ministers back in the UK? By myself, I am not strong enough for what's required. By myself, all I can really do is continue compartmentalizing the horror and the fear and the grief, keep them locked up, um, which actually isn't all that hard because there are always more emails to answer and always more sermons to write. And it's totally possible to live in denial. But what if we agreed to risk something different here, something real? We Christians don't have any monopoly on, on mutual support. Support is a human thing. It happens in all kinds of ways, and it doesn't require religion. But draw on the resources of religion, and the whole enterprise expands. That promise of Jesus that he would be with us whenever even two or three of us gathered together. Do you hear that? The comfort and the healing he's offering? the unshakable hope and power that people experience when they're with him, God's own care for our souls, why in heaven's name would we settle for anything less? And if God, the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and spread the earth, who breathes life into human beings and spirit for the road they walk, that God is reaching out a hand to us because we're supposed to be a light for the nations, I'd settle just for being a bit of light for Mercer Island, but who knows? Um, respond to an invitation from this God, offer some tiny little thing, and the next thing you know, it's been multiplied a thousandfold. That's how our God works. And that's actually where I'm coming from. These worship services were my idea, or so I believe. But from the moment I committed myself to them, there's been a hurricane winding up in my soul. What if we could unite our energies and create a church like that for the Holy Spirit to work through? Break a few molds, reinvent it, whatever needs to happen. This is the sort of thing that we human beings are going to have to do if we are to survive this crisis. Spiritual grounding, meaningful spiritual support, and refueling so that we send each other out strong for all the things we've got to do. 
The church has a whole store of fantastic stories to tell. We've got wisdom from an inexhaustible source. We've got centuries worth of testimony for encouragement about how the Spirit transforms people's lives. There are spiritual resources to see us through the personal changes that lie ahead. And there are community resources to help us sustain one another in hope and determination. There's lots of great stuff. First on the list for me is the resource of community. Separately, the magnitude of the situation will overwhelm us. Together, we're strong. Together, we can keep reminding ourselves that it's all about love. God's love for creation and ours, and God's love for us and our love for each other. Now take that out of abstract pretty language into the concrete, and what I mean is singing and storytelling and prayer and food and friendship, all those familiar things. The hurricane in me is for all of that to be filled with the Spirit of God healing and inviting and empowering us. Um, as a church, we've done it before in recent memory. Some of you were here. Um, we were the first on the island to declare ourselves open and affirming, by which we meant an explicit welcome to gay people and lesbian people and transgender and bisexual and genderqueer folk. Um, practically all the churches on the island are in that place now. Praise the Lord, that's great news. Um, we were first. Maybe we could lead on this too. Come to know what you know and feel what you feel. We believe that whenever even two or three of us gather, sharing the truth we've been carrying by ourselves, then Christ joins us in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is to say that God shows up. And fear turns into hope, and grief turns into determination. What do you think? In a few moments, we'll all be invited to share in communion. It's completely up to you whether or not you want to take the bread and the wine. But if you're not sure, if you haven't made up your mind about that, or you are, if normally you don't, I'd like to say, please consider joining in today. See what happens. I have a real sense that God is here waiting to move among us. And communion is a place where we too open the door for that to happen. And then stick around for coffee. Reach out to somebody. Don't be too friendly to the visitors who are with us today because we don't want to scare anybody away. <laughs> A real conversation to be had, have it. If there's a story to tell, tell it. If something is stirring in you, then share it. Let's be real with each other. Because real is where God meets us. No other place, only there. And that's what so much needs to happen. Amen. We invite your offerings for the work that God wants to do in this place.